Every baby needs someone to mother him. Maternal neglect deprives infants of the emotional stimulation necessary for healthy development and growth, and which comes from warm human contact. The capacity to love, to tolerate frustration, and to enjoy life all grow out of a mother-child relationship which guarantees satisfaction of the child's basic needs. Adequate maternal care in infancy gives even a child from an impoverished family the emotional equipment which enables him to start life on an equal footing with others. Without such a start, he is not likely to catch up. Hospital studies of children who fail to thrive show that some of them have organic diseases which inhibit growth. In others, no organic disease can be found. Yet in the hospital, they make surprising gains in weight and level of development without special medical treatment. Careful developmental histories show that these children have suffered maternal deprivation in their own homes. This film presents two children with severe growth and development retardation, yet who have no demonstrable organic disease. We will see the effects produced when intensive human stimulation is substituted for the sensory deprivation they experienced in their own homes because of maternal neglect. Nora, the younger child, is 14 months old, yet she weighs only 9 pounds. Like this healthy boy of the same age, she should weigh about 25 pounds and should be able to show a similar zest in living. We will follow Nora throughout her seven weeks stay in this hospital. Here is Nora's first feeding in the hospital. Nora and two older siblings were abandoned by their mother. After four days alone in a vacant house, they were rescued by neighbors and brought to the hospital. Nora was born prematurely and spent the first two months of life in the maternity hospital nursery. At home, her emotionally disturbed mother allowed her to lie unattended in her crib for most of her waking hours. She claimed that Nora did not like to be held or cuddled and would not even try to eat solid food. The mother's own illness prevented her from remembering exactly how much Nora ate each day. It appears that Nora was abandoned emotionally long before she was abandoned physically. She got only enough food to sustain life and not enough stimulation to promote development. Dr. Whitten's examination shows the severity of Nora's impairment. Such effects of maternal deprivation may be difficult to distinguish from those caused by organic disease. Nora cannot speak. Her feeble cry is brief. Her grasp is weak. The startle reflex is present, although it should have disappeared six months ago. She tries to withdraw from contact by covering her eyes and seeking the solace of her thumb. She cannot or will not hold the pencil. She is unable to sit or even to hold up her head steadily without support. All muscle systems are weak and lack tonus. She is profoundly apathetic. She shows no interest in objects which fascinate most infants. Her legs are atrophied from disuse. They cannot support her weight. Her buttocks are excoriated from lying for weeks in her own excrement. A large bed sore makes sitting and lying painful. Her weakness is not due to dehydration, for her skin tone is good. Knee jerks are absent. Most babies of this age are interested in keys and will try to grasp them immediately. Nora can follow the keys with her eyes, but she does not reach out for them, and her interest is fleeting. The characteristic position of her hands suggests avoidance of contact and a lack of practice in holding or manipulating objects. Here on the tenth day in the hospital, Nora is fastened onto a metabolic frame which permits the continuous collection of urine and feces. This is required for the metabolic studies which were the original reason for admitting Nora and Sally to the hospital. 
Nora's passive submission to restraint is in itself most unusual, since a healthy child of this age would protest vigorously. Nora's face has become more expressive than it was on admission. Now, instead of avoiding eye contact, she watches the nurse and from time to time attempts to imitate her smile and gesture. So far, she can tolerate only a minimum of such stimulation. When her capacity is exceeded, she cries. Unlike most children, Nora's facial expression often does not reveal whether she is alone or with other people. In this scene, people are with her. Now they leave. This scene condenses five minutes of solitude during which no change in her expression can be seen. When a child comes to play with her and takes her blanket, Nora withdraws by clutching the blanket and covering her eyes. On the 14th day, Nora is being fondled by the nurse. This kind of stimulating play has been a regular part of her hospital experience. While she passively accepts the caresses, her face reflects pleasure. As her right hand is stroked, the left seems to respond also. She almost smiles. Her neck muscles are so weak that her head must be supported by the nurse. Her mother claimed that Nora actually disliked this kind of human contact. While it is true that she does not reach out or try to prolong the play, she certainly does nothing to avoid contact. Her facial expressions are as fleeting as those of a newborn infant. On the 18th day, Nora is taking her morning bath. She seems less frightened than she did before. Although she still avoids looking at the doctor, she appears alert and responsive. By the 25th day, Nora has gained weight, sucks well, and can even hold the bottle with one hand. She has developed a genuine smile, which contrasts with her appearance on admission. She has begun to talk and has developed a special liking for this nurse whom she calls Mama. She can almost sit by herself. The nurse says that Nora can transfer objects from one hand to another, but she will not do it for the camera. By the 30th day, she can sit unassisted and maintains her balance despite hiccups which threaten to capsize her. On the 35th day, she is undressed for another examination. She obviously enjoys a kind of play which would have terrified her five weeks ago. She is fascinated by faces and looks intently at everyone. This she would not do at her first examination, which we see here. Although Nora wants the pencil, she hesitates to take it until it is placed directly in her hand. This unusual reluctance to reach out has persisted since admission. She also hesitates to take the keys. Once she has them, her grasp is firm. Nora's muscle tone is firm also. There is no head lag when she is pulled upright. She still sits unsteadily. Her 
legs are limber, and she moves them easily. Although she is not yet able to walk, her legs are no longer flexed constantly. as they were on admission. Knee jerks are present and active bilaterally. The startle reflex is gone. Of the bed sore, only a small scar remains. The fetal position of five weeks ago is replaced by this alert posture. On the 42nd day, Nora cooperates in the block play arranged by the nurse. It is obvious that she is more interested in communicating with the nurse than in playing with the blocks. This relationship and her responsive appearance in these scenes contrasts sharply with her appearance on admission. final examination in the hospital, Nora sits confidently. Nurses say that she can now pull herself upright. On the 45th day after admission, Nora at last can eat solid food. Today she will leave the hospital for a foster home. We will now consider Sally, who already has been in this hospital four weeks. She is almost four years old, yet she weighs only 18 pounds and displays none of the abilities characteristic of this age. Like these healthy four-year-olds, Sally should weigh about 35 pounds and should be able to keep up with their activities. Sally is responding to the care she has already received in this hospital. Her present appearance makes it difficult to believe that at the time of admission Sally did not even hold a spoon. She did not protest when placed on the metabolic frame. She did not complain when she was left alone. This is Sally's third hospitalization for growth failure. The previous brief stays on busy pediatric wards failed to improve her condition Sally's mother was incapacitated by epilepsy, alcoholism, and the desertion by her husband, who left her when she was six months pregnant with Sally. These circumstances made her unable to care for Sally properly. The child's living conditions resemble those which have been described in poorly run children's institutions. She was left in her crib with her bottle for most of her life, cared for primarily by her siblings, the eldest only eleven. This care seldom went beyond filling her empty bottle. Sally's mother projected her own inadequacies onto the child, claiming that Sally did not like to be held, preferred to be alone, and even refused to eat solid food. Much has changed in the four weeks since Sally entered the hospital, yet all her movements are clumsy. Despite a good attention span, her general level of functioning is that of a two-year-old child. She still walks like a toddler. Four weeks ago, if milk were given to her when she was not hungry, she would let it trickle out of her mouth, but all this has changed. Here she wants her bottle and will accept no substitutes. When she is pressed, however, she falls back on the method we have seen Nora use. That is, she tries to cover her face and shut out reality.
When at last she was given her bottle, the nurse was instructed to be unresponsive in order to demonstrate Sally's increasing interest in the kind of human contact which her mother claimed the child disliked. When affection is not offered, Sally tries to evoke it by her own actions. Her developing mastery is even more evident in her objection to restraint on the metabolic frame. Four weeks ago, she accepted such restraints passively. Now that her apathy is a thing of the past, she can protest appropriately. Sally's interest in her stimulating nurses now has spread to include the objects which they provide for her use. a child who probably never saw a coloring book or held a crayon until recently, Sally is learning rapidly. Severe myopia causes her to peer through half-closed lids. Her vision will be corrected with glasses. Her ward companions follow her progress with interest. On the fifth week in the hospital, while Nora is being readied for her morning feeding, Sally clamors for attention. She is jealous of the newcomer, and like a child who has been displaced by a new sibling, she tries to win back her former favored position. When she finally gains the nurse's side, she tries to interfere with her rival's meal under the pretext of being helpful. Her child taught Sally a simple card game. She manipulates the cards skillfully and plays eagerly. Five and a half weeks after admission, this feeding was arranged to test the mother's claim that Sally would eat no solid food except potato chips and would not even try to drink from a cup. Since Sally's mouth is sore from a thrush infection, it is not likely that potato chips were her favorite food. While a tiny doll's cup is not a fair test of her drinking abilities, it does show that her failure is not from lack of enthusiasm for the task. Note the deft manner in which she can grasp the delicate handle. Her finger dexterity has improved greatly since admission. Here Sally takes the easy way out. Sally now consumes large quantities of food, but only in the presence of a loved nurse. Whenever she leaves, Sally stops eating and does not begin again until the nurse returns. This demonstrates that her ability to eat still depends upon a relationship to the people whom she has come to trust. Now she is able to indicate her preference or dislike, as here she shows her dislike for a particular food. Earlier she could not. We will see that the head shaking with which she indicated her food choice continues later in the service of teasing and controlling the nurse and of prolonging the whole enjoyable feeding process. It is important not to mistake this head shaking gesture as a simple refusal of food, as Sally's mother apparently did. This gesture originates early in childhood before it has the meaning of no. It is especially likely to carry over into later life unchanged in meaning in children who have experienced early deprivation. It is just these children who are most in need of patience and encouragement in feeding. In contrast to her other hospital experiences, Sally was for two weeks the only child on this hospital unit which had just opened. Thus, she had the undivided attention of the nursing staff this accident allowed her to receive a massive dose of tender loving care. In retrospect, it appears that this amount of individual human attention was required for her improvement. When the nurse leaves again, Sally's disappointment is evident. She stops eating like a machine that is shut off. Her pleasure at the nurse's return is equally apparent. 
Sally's responsiveness to this kind of attention suggests that her mother was mistaken in assuming, as she did, that her child preferred solitary activities. Six weeks after admission, Sally has been fitted with glasses to correct her severe myopia. These scenes are a condensation of the first half hour of her new visual experience. At first, she does not look through the lenses, but peers under them as she is used to doing. When she does look through them, she does not appear to recognize the images and soon returns to the old method of seeing. Glancing up at the nurse forces her to look squarely through the lenses. She appears surprised and pleased by her ability to recognize a nurse at a distance for the first time. As she becomes accustomed to using the lenses, Sally takes increasing pleasure in the novelty of seeing objects clearly. No doubt defective vision contributed to the sensory deprivation Sally experienced in her own home, but it was not likely to have been a major cause of her apathy. Even blind children do not show such developmental retardation if they receive adequate stimulation through other senses. Sally's improvement preceded the arrival of her new glasses. Now there is an inner readiness to use the new sensory data provided by distinct vision. Myopia may have added to sensory deprivation in yet another way. If she could not see her mother's facial expressions clearly, she could not respond to them. Thus, she may have seemed emotionally dull to her mother, who could justify her claim that her child did not need human contact. Here, for the first time, Sally actually can see the cameraman at work. Apparently, she realizes only now that there has always been someone behind the camera, but she could not see him at a distance. The new lenses alter her depth perception. She will learn to compensate for this. Sally is good-natured about her failures and seems satisfied with her achievement. Two weeks after leaving the hospital, Sally returns for a follow-up visit. Now she looks through the lenses all the time. Her manual dexterity has increased to the point that she is able to eat with one hand while she turns the pages with the other. The severity of her growth retardation can be appreciated when one realizes that her young companion in this scene is younger than Sally and small for her size because of severe anemia. Sally's depth perception has improved. Other aspects of her psychomotor and social development continue at a rapid pace, but after gaining three pounds, her weight has reached a plateau. Seven weeks of good nursing care, which emphasized warm human contact and stimulation, have significantly improved the condition of two children whose growth and development had been impaired by maternal deprivation. This rapid improvement was achieved by methods which can be duplicated in any hospital. By exposing the children to stimulating experiences with human beings, their downhill course was arrested and development was set in motion again. A complete diagnostic study of such children must include an adequate therapeutic trial of human contact and stimulation. Psychological scars will remain. One cannot predict the degree of recovery still possible. The outcome will be affected by the quality of care they receive after they leave the hospital.